Hey guys, I'm Danica Patrick, and you're watching The Breakdown. Rush. So back in these days, cars were really dangerous. So this is a time when people died a lot, unfortunately. Dangerous in the world of racing especially. It's come a long way since then. People would race in these conditions. It's the fact that the cars and the safety precautions were not as safe. So the cars didn't have, you know, their heads were more exposed. Maybe the way that the car fell apart, like now pieces of the car are tethered to things so they don't come off. Also safety runoffs, gravel traps, sand traps, barricades. There wasn't armco fencing anymore. Actually, I drove back in England in uh, the early 2000s and someone drove, a, a, a kid died who crashed into an armco fence, which is just like that aluminum wavy sort of fencing. He drove through it and it, it killed him. But they don't have that kind of thing now. There's tire barriers in front of it and things like that. So back in the day, it just wasn't, they didn't have the precautions on the cars or around the cars on the track to keep them safe when they went off track. Japan, that's where I won my one IndyCar race. It's very hard to accelerate in the rain. In these conditions, it must be almost impossible to drive a 450 horsepower car. It's definitely true that when you're you know, racing in the rain, you can't see. I remember racing in England for one of, you know, my, one of the first few times in the rain and you had to use the white lines on the outside of the track to know where you were going because you couldn't see in front of you because it was all spray. Like that, spray, now be right underneath and behind that, you can't see. You also wouldn't want to use an Apex in the rain. Those are fairly dangerous because they take the car off the track. Nikki Lauda is bringing the Ferrari number one into the pit. Yeah, the pit crew is, is critical. Like, I mean, when you're traveling at a football field a second, you know, and your crew takes an extra second to get you out of the pits, now you're a lot further behind. That makes a big difference under caution or under green. Under green, you might not actually lose a position, but you might lose a lot of track position. So they'll look into that as far as like when to pit, if you have a big gap or if you're really close to people. Under caution, you are definitely gonna lose a lot of um, spots because everybody's coming in single file. So, you know, if your crew takes an extra second, then, you know, you might lose five, seven spots, 10 spots. Just depends. Grand Prix. <laughs> Oh yeah, look at the suspension moving like it should. Nice. I mean, if you're trying to get their attention, the best thing you can do is pass them or take them out. But no one is ever gonna see you, you know, no one's ever gonna hear you. No one's going to probably see you put your hand out the window and say, ah, you're number one. So I would get very frustrated in the car and I'd be screaming on the radio. And I finally came to the conclusion that it's my job to pass the car in front of me. And that's the best vengeance I could ever get is to pass them and drive away. And there's no point in complaining about what they're doing, even if it is wrong, because there's nothing that's gonna, that's not gonna, not gonna help me. It's only gonna distract me. It took a long time for me to learn that, but um, once I did, it just allowed me to focus better. I actually did drive through that tunnel when I was in Jay-Z's music video. It's called Show Me What You Got. Um, we drove through that tunnel. I've never driven uh, Monaco otherwise, but I've driven through the tunnel and around the carousel area where the casino is. Oh yeah, that puts you out of the race. See how he hit the brake? He's trying to slow down. All those are things that maybe back in the day did exist. Like, could you drive off into the water? Maybe. Was there a mountain? that you could maybe uh, crash into or drive up, maybe. But nowadays, those things are completely closed off with fencing, tire barriers, sand traps, gravel traps, high fencing. All those things are, are safety precautions. So again, I'm not sure what existed back in those days, which looks like maybe the 60s or something, 70s, 2019, it's a lot different. The cars don't look like that anymore. You're 
the drivers don't look like that anymore in the car. The safety precautions outside of the car and inside the car don't look like that anymore. Nothing about it looks the same other than it's the same basics of racing. So the bare essentials are there, the fundamentals of a driver in a car and a track and things like that, but that as far as everything else, all the, all the details of the aesthetics don't look anything like that anymore. Herbie Fully Loaded. I actually went to the Herbie Fully Loaded premiere. Okay, let's go get down. Stop. First off, as far as Herbie being like a person and, you know, having uh, eyes and, you know, responding to her, I mean, there is something to an inanimate object having like an energy. While, of course, you know, your headlights aren't going to wink at you, I do think that you can have kind of a little bit of an energetic connection with a certain car that you had good luck with, or maybe it's a helmet or a suit or gloves or shoes and I sure had things that I thought were better than others or an energetic connection with stuff. My car never winked at me but maybe it metaphorically did. Was there ever like a good luck charm that you kept with you? I really tried to not believe in good luck charms because they're only real if you believe in them. So I tried not to believe in them because then all of a sudden my optimism or hope for the race was revolving around a pair of gloves or shoes or something like that. So I tried to not develop them. Now I put two hair ties around my wrist because what if one broke? I had no routine for getting in the car, the order of things, but that was just practicality. So yeah, I didn't really do that. The weirdest superstition that I ever heard was the late Dan Weldon said that his best races were when he peed in a suit in the car three times. You could. You could pee in your suit if you wanted to pee in your suit. I tried one time. I was driving down the front straightaway at Hindi. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I have to pee already. And it's the first yellow of the race. It's like there's hundreds and hundreds of miles to go. And so I drove down the front straightaway and I remember thinking, come on, you, you can do it. Just go. But you know what? I've been practicing not going in my pants for a really long time, so I couldn't do it. You know, the likelihood of a VW competing with a stock car is a lot higher than a VW competing with an Indy car, let's say, because of aerodynamics. Maybe if the Herbie fully loaded car was winking at you, you would have a little more hope that you could compete with 700 horsepower, you know, highly tuned stock cars. I think she drove it home, right? Like, I mean, this is her street car. So if we're just even looking at that kind of aerodynamics of being able to go over potholes and speed bumps and not uh, bottom out or tear a splitter off or hit the track bar mount. Must have had a lot of horsepower. In the world of racing, there's still not a lot of women, so when you see one, it stands out, and then you're, you're kind of forced into thinking about it, and then, of course, your thinking makes you draw a conclusion of whether or not you like it or don't like it, so I guess there's a lot more forced judgment on things when it's different. You know, women weren't even allowed in pit lane back in the day, and there I was being cheered for for my very first Indy 500 every time I came in to the pits during rookie orientation weekend. So, like, times are way different. But the ability to have people believe that you can do it as easily as if a guy came along, I think you're always gonna have to get over that initial hump of like, okay, they can drive, because even with a guy, can you drive? But I feel like as a girl, you might have to prove yourself a little bit more to keep them believing. And then of course there'll be some, more so for a girl than for a guy, that will just never believe because they don't want to. Drive. This is one I haven't seen. You know, I actually drive just like I would want to on the street as I did in a race car, which is I just wanted to be a little bit faster than everyone else on the road. That's it. Like in a race, just be a little bit faster than everyone. So that's what I do on the street too. The thing about driving is that you are pushing the grip limit a lot. So this one right here, you're turning left while in the gravel. Now, a regular road car, you're not, you're not at max grip before you enter that gravel area, that dirt area. They're not at max speed. Now, on a racetrack, you're going obviously much higher speed 
terminal velocity wise. And then you turn, and so you're going, you're turning at max potential speed, right? Because you're going flat out otherwise, right? So, and if you go flat out, then you're just trimming downforce off the car so that you have less grip in the corners, but it doesn't matter because you're still comfortable. So no matter what, you're always reaching that grip limit, and that's what that's what racing's all about. That's what going fast is all about. So when I see a car driving in the dirt, I'm like, wow, your grip just went from like here to here in a second. That's why when you're on the racetrack and you go to pass somebody, you go into what's called the marbles. Basically, when you drive in a certain line, it gets clean, like that line gets clean. And also the rubber from the tires, it's, it's eventually, de it's deteriorating, right? So it's coming off of the car and where is it's going? It's going above it. So that area is called the marbles. So if you go up there to pass somebody, it's like hitting dirt, very dangerous. Do not get in the marbles. Of course, on the roads versus on the racetrack, there's a lot of rules, a lot more rules. I break a lot of them, a lot. Handbrakes, very handy. Have you ever drove backwards really fast? You move the wheel just a little bit and it's gonna throw the car in another direction. When you watch a race, it looks easy because you're not, they're not sideways, they're not out of control. And you don't do that on the road, you're not sideways out of control, so you watch it and you're like, oh my God, that looks so hard, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I can't do that either. I'm not good at going sideways, I, it's not my thing. But driving inside of the grip limit, maximizing that limit is my thing. So it doesn't always look fancy, but to meet that threshold is very hard. Real racing doesn't translate on camera as being exciting or something outside of your comfort zone nearly as much. Now, if you were inside of my body, inside the car, and feeling it and feeling what I was chasing the whole time with the throttle or with the brake or with the steering wheel or whatever it may be, then you would be impressed, but that doesn't translate on camera. The Italian job. Oh yeah, good one. The minis. Thanks, John. So in this movie, they famously like soup up the minis. Can yeah. Can you do that to any car? Can you make any car into sure. the same muscle car? So I guess the two examples, my very first car was a Mustang Cobra, and I was blowing through brakes. Like I was on my third set of brakes at 8,000 miles. We put stiffer sway bars on it so it'd handle better racing brakes. And anyway, so yes, you can soup up even your road car. Now let's say the a little while back, I did some two-seater rides, and I did it in what was a real race car. It was a Porsche sports car that raced in probably like the American Le Mans series or something. And somebody bought that car from the racetrack and then made it just inside of what street legal was. So, you know, I had a car initially that we took a little bit past what you'd buy from the dealership, and then I also had a car on the racetrack that was street legal actually, but was a race car. So it's as far to the extent of race cars it could possibly be by being, but being on a racetrack. It had enough to drive on the road. I mean, actually that's the, the history of NASCAR came from taking regular cars during the prohibition and souping them up to get away from the police. And then NASCAR was born. I also thought an interesting fact was the fact that an Indy car could drive upside down if you were brave enough because the downforce that it was making at the speed you were going, or wasn't even the top speed, it was just 180 or something like that, was more than the weight of the car. In physics, you can drive upside down. So could they, they weren't driving upside down, but I just thought that was an interesting tidbit. Has it been done? No, and I won't be doing that either. I will not be the first one to try that. Pretty sure a Mini Cooper is gonna beat a bike in a tunnel. You can also make cars bulletproof. Pause. I do think that the way that movies like launch cars and land them, I mean, you're gonna mess your shit up if you do that. Like, you're gonna break the front end. They don't just land and then keep going, but you know, it's the movies. I remember I jumped a four-wheeler over a, over a rise one time and I thought, oh my gosh, I was probably three feet in the air for 10 feet. It was like a tiniest little air and a very short distance, but it feels big. Driving through a tunnel where you don't know where you're going at, you know, max speed, probably not. But the leader will always be the slowest because you're following and no matter where they go, you know you're safe. So in racing, you learn your way, but on the regular roads, you don't. So it's a different level of bravery, a dumber level of bravery, I think, when you don't know where you're going, but you go there anyway. 
Le Mans. So I actually was right on pit lane for the green flag of the 24 hours of Le Mans one year. I never raced it, but I lived in England during for a couple of years, for three years. And one year, a group of us drove down for Le Mans. We just we didn't have any passes or anything. We just looked like we knew what we were doing. So we made our way down to pit lane and we're there right for the green flag. It was the year it was 106 degrees. That's what I remember. <laughs> Probably like 2001 or two. Smoking in the pits, probably not. Maybe, for, of course, back in the day, but uh, you know, fuel in an igniter is not a good idea. In a lot of these movies, they seem to be using different kinds of flags to throw the green. Usually it's a green. You start the race on a green flag as well, not on a uh, daytime clock. So I get what they're trying to say, like here it is, the start of 24 hours, it's straight up noon, let's go, but <laughs> it's not usually used to start a race off of a regular clock. The 24 hours of Le Mans is like a, it's a standard race, you know, you, you go out and you, you race for 24 hours and you have a transponder. It will have a beacon at the start finish line and trip that trigger every time with the transponder to show how many laps you've done. So it's a race to the finish. So, I mean, back in the day, gosh, somebody might have won Le Mans by, by laps, maybe, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a very good uh, history buff when it comes to racing, but to be honest, I'm not a good history buff with anything. So it can get very spread out is the point because after 24 hours, it wouldn't be weird if somebody was many laps ahead after that long. But what's amazing, and I still find this amazing now when I think about it, is that you can travel miles around a track and be within thousands of a second and have completely different cars, completely different drivers, just only driving on the same track, but having different lines, different setups, and, uh, and be that close. It's uh, kind of fascinating. If we use common sense, you're not doing the 24 hours yourself. So you have multiple drivers and you usually drive for a few hours, uh, two, three hours, four maybe, and then there'll be a driver change and someone else will come in. So you'll try and get a window of sleep a couple times during the 24 hours. Now the people that don't get a lot of rest are the crews and engineers and car chiefs and crew chiefs. Uh, they don't really get a lot of rest during these races, so they're probably pretty exhausted by the end, but they're also not driving the car. So I'd say just by the end of it all, it's pure exhaustion. People sitting there, working on it the whole time, thinking about fuel, making changes. I mean, sometimes during these 24 hour races, they'll change brakes, replace the brake pads, things like that will go. I mean, it just depends on what fails, but those can sometimes even be planned into a race this long. Were those the cars? Yeah, was it the track? Yeah, the storylines, I don't know, fabricated, exaggerated. You know, they did have open face helmets back in the day. So uh, yeah, there's lots of similarity, but of course nothing is like the real thing. And while the movie will be over within two hours, the 24 hours of Le Mans is actually 24 hours. Turbo. Turbo weaving between lap cars like a snail possessed. He is determined to hold on to his lead. Not sure what you want to know is realistic or not realistic. However, that, that view of turn two, four, turn four, that's the front straightaway. I mean, some of that looks a little bit more realistic, but a snail beating an Indy car? No. I haven't watched many cartoons in my life. I think there was a missing part of my childhood with cartoons, so I never, I just don't, I don't watch them, never have. I've never seen cars. I mean, who am I? Like I'm a race car driver that's never seen cars. The CGI of the track itself, yeah, that kind of looks familiar. There might have been three wide back in the day when Indianapolis Motor Speedway had an apron that you could drive down. There, there was maybe some three wide racing then, but it's, it's tough to go two wide at Indy, so three wide wasn't happening. I mean, your ability to see a snail flying over your car while you're spinning out and clip its wing off or whatever it did, it's fun to live in the world of fantasy. It's, it's where your mind gets to wander and you take things to the furthest extent. However, not realistic at all. Oh, oh, oh. A track has a wall on the inside and outside, or at least definitely on the outside. So when there's an accident, sometimes it does block the way. And one of the things that can be really hard when you're actually in the car is stopping in time for it or missing it. I mean, the, to actually come to a stop when an accident happens is impossible. 
I mean, you're going from 230 miles an hour to stopping. That's going to take some distance, and it's probably not going to happen in reaction time to an accident. So that's not happening. But the road does get blocked, and that, that can definitely be the case. I mean, I remember probably the most dramatic one was Michigan. It's probably 2010, maybe. It was Dan Weldon and Dario Franchitti, and I was running third. And Dan and Dario came together, and Dario flipped over Dan's car. I went underneath him, and I turned around to look behind me, and there was nobody coming, like nobody. And I thought, oh my gosh, what just happened? And it's because the accident was so big and it collected so many people that there was, there was no cars coming because they had either crashed or they had slowed down so much to avoid it. And I think maybe the race had like seven cars in it after that. So that, that's pretty creepy, but that's just because the road gets blocked. Gone in 60 seconds. Okay, so I'm sure they wet the ground to make it easier to get sideways. So obviously that's happening. I'm betting it didn't rain in LA where they shot it. <laughs> I did a little cameo in a movie recently and I had a stunt driver. So I'm gonna say there's probably a 100% chance that it wasn't Nicolas Cage doing stunt driving. This was a fantastic movie for driving scenes, of course, as they're stealing cars. And this was uh, Esther, or what was it again? Eleanor. Eleanor, Eleanor um, of course, was an old famous car, so um, being very rare. Suspect has increased speed to 120. 18 visual air one, 140 miles an hour. Do not lose him. That was definitely not 140 miles an hour where you just saw that camera angle that was going really fast. That was definitely fast forwarded. And you could probably, I mean, 140 sounds fairly realistic for that kind of environment. And the fact that there was NOS or Boost or whatever, that's not out of the picture either because back when I raced Indy cars, the, um, the cars had like an overtake button. So they could make it as dramatic as you really wanted. So it could actually go, Rah. I mean, it's just all done in an ECU, which is just a computer system that will change timing, change RPM potential. So for us in an Indy car, the, the push to pass is what it was called, would give you an extra couple hundred RPM in each gear. So it would really compound over a straightaway if you did it at the beginning when you were in first or second gear. So you could go all the way through the gears using it to get to a higher speed. So push to pass, boost, NOS, maybe we got it from the movies. He can drive, he's using boost, that helps. Also. So don't think that helicopter went under a bridge, but you know, I'd love to, I'd love to see that really happen. I think the most accurate movie was probably Rush. They portrayed what it looks like when it's raining and um, the spray and the track and the driver point of view in a pretty accurate way. I'm Danica Patrick and thank you for watching.